This episode of the Restoration Today podcast is brought to you by Surety. Surety is the third party fund control company founded by those who understand the entire restoration industry, especially the paying contractors experience just trying to get paid. Surety establishes payment rails from insurance carriers to restoration contractors, protecting property owners and every party from risk using 3D geospatial scan technology. If you want to reduce your debt, free up your admin staff and improve the experience of your clients, book a demo with Surety today. Hello there. Thanks for checking out a very exciting episode of the Restoration Today podcast. Today, I'm joined by two incredible scientists, and we are going to be talking about toxic chemicals in our lives and how they disrupt our bodies and our hormones, as well as the environment, and really dive into some amazing technology and innovation and scientific research that's being done in the area of chemicals and how we're cleaning and what we're putting in our homes and our bodies and all of those things. It's a big topic, and we're going to try to talk about it in as much detail as possible in a short window of time. So I am joined by um, Dr. Terry Collins and Dr. Pete Myers. They both have PhDs. Um, they are both uh, among the founding people of the company Sudoc, which makes Dot Cleaner, which hopefully some of my listeners have heard of Dot Cleaner, seen it at trade shows or in CNR or whatever that may be. So both of these gentlemen are highly decorated scientists with a number of very impressive accolades in the scientific community, many of which um, are involved in the, a lot of those awards and accolades do have to do with their service to the environmental and to environmental and community health. So gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. I'm very excited to have you here. So Dr. Collins, Terry, I'm going to toss it over to you first to have you kind of introduce yourself and share your background in science and how you got where, where Sudoc came from. Well, um, I first of all come from that picture behind you that's uh, New Zealand's highest uh, mountain I've lived in the United States since 1978 um, I'm a, a professor of chemistry and the director of the Institute for Green Science at Carnegie Mellon University um, and we worry about how to how to turn to make chemistry sustainable currently it's categorically not sustainable we want to contribute to reshaping the chemical enterprise literally that bigger a hope so that the chemicals of the future will be sustainable um i teach um i have a large research program the area is extremely interdisciplinary and one of my great co greatest colleagues is is uh, pete myers we talk almost daily about how to do this and so i'll turn it over pete to pete that was a great segue. I love this. <laughs> Go ahead, Pete, introduce yourself. Well, well, thank you. It's a delight to be here. Uh, we're very interested in helping your audience understand the the um, benefits that Sudox chemistry can bring their work. I am not from New Zealand. I am from the U.S. <laughs> and also I, I lived all over Latin America while growing up. I got a PhD from Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Uh, and have been working in several fields uh, ever since that. Um, I currently am the chief scientist and uh, board chair of an organization I founded uh, all, 20 years ago called Environmental Health Sciences, the point of which, the purpose of which, the founding purpose of which is to help uh, people of, at all levels understand that there are great opportunities to protect their health by learning about chemicals and, and the bad things that chemicals can do, but also increasingly, especially because of my, my uh, collaboration with Terry, we're trying to help chemists make money by learning how to make safer chemicals. It can be done. Our knowledge of chemistry and, and, and specifically of the way that chem chemicals interact with our bodies mm -hmm gives us so much more information than we had when today's chemicals were invented that we can do a much better job by incorporating that new science uh, into chemistry. That's my goal. That's why Terry and I work together. So how and, long and when Pete talks about making money, um, what he's what he's doing is uh, highlighting the very clear, obvious thing that that heck actually you, you have to be able to make money to run an economy. Yes. The way we built the world around us, chemicals are critical. You pull the chemicals out, and we don't, we wear and deep doo doo very quickly. Yep. Um, but in it, but 
the the point is that to make money without all of the downsides that we have with current chemicals and of course this means that some chemicals uh, are going to have to be replaced mm -hmm. so how long have you two worked to, together and share a little bit about the foundation of sudoc how long sudoc has been around and your main goal and mission as a company well i'll start this one because i found pete in the mid to late 90s Okay. through the mechanism of this amazing book that he co-authored, Our Stolen Future. Yep. And Our Stolen Future is about impacts of trace chemicals on the endocrine system, the hormonal system that controls um, uh, how we function and, and also how we develop. The development part is particularly critical. And I read it and I thought, oh my gosh, I read it again and I read it again. And ever since my class... Uh, now for nearly 20, well, for 25 years, has read that book and written a three-page essay on it, on its impact on them. So I sort of know it <laughs> like the back of my hand. But it's about trace chemicals really wrecking uh, animals in the environment. And of course, um, we're animals. So yeah. I'll now turn it over to Pete uh, to say well, that. That's how we got going. <laughs> that That is precisely how we got going. And it was such a delight when I stumbled across Terry at a meeting at Carnegie Mellon uh, University uh, in, in around 2004. Uh, and it, we've been working together ever since. Um, endocrine disruption is the technical term for the type of chemistry and chemical effects that we study. And the endocrine system, the hormone system, uh, is basically a way to send messages from one part of your body to another part of your body to make things happen when they need to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so the messages, the message system that we use are hormones. And there are lots of different types of hormones. And there are also lots of different chemicals that hack those signals and prevent them from getting there or actually mimic them. And so the, a message arrives when it shouldn't. And uh, when that happens, um, serious health problems can ensue. Not necessarily, but it, it, endocrine disruption is now linked to a wide range of health problems, things like diabetes, things like miswired brains, which is one of the most uh, frightening of, uh, of the effects that it has, where you literally your brain gets wired differently if you're exposed in the womb when your brain is forming. Um, it affects your immune system. It affects your fertility. Uh, it, it, hormones control all parts of the development of, of who you become and endocrine disruptors can hack those messages and do. What are some of the most common endocrine disruptors that we encounter? I don't know how comfortable you are like naming specific chemicals. No, I'm, I'm totally comfortable. Um, it, by the way, Pete coined the term endocrine disruption at a major meeting in 1991 where a group of clairvoyants got together and, and said, oh, my God, look what's happening. For, uh, uh, by reading the messages from nature, these chemicals are hacking the hormone system. Uh, this is terrible. Um, unfortunately, uh, we some uh, the, many endocrine disruptors are everyday, everywhere chemicals. Yeah. You can't get away from them. Bisphenol A is the signature um, endocrine disruptor. The phthalates that are powerful antiandrogens and others, they mess up uh, signaling of the male hormone system are, uh, are there. And Terry, they, Terry if, if you'd let me, um, we might point out where they're found. Uh, bisphenol A the, and the bisphenols in general are, are found in, in plastic, um, especially polycarbonate plastic, which is pretty much pure BPA uh, mm -hmm. as it was originally made. The phthalates are also found in plastics. They make plastics uh, softer and flexible. Uh, a rubber duck, that famous toy, uh, yeah. rubber ducky, um, it can be as much as 40% phthalates. Uh, it's made wow. out of PVC, pla PVC plastic, but to make that plastic, instead of the rigid stuff that PVC is, you add lots of phthalates and it becomes flexible. But, it, but the problem, the big problem with that is that the phthalates are not bound chemically to the, um, the PVC, instead, they're just basically they ooze in and out. And that means they can ooze in and out and get onto your skin or get on the dust that you breathe or lots of lots of sources of contamination. And I should mention that right now, as we are speaking, there is a fabulous uh, 
NPR show called 1A, which is examining one of the most serious of the phthalates or of the um, endocrine disrupting compounds called PFAS or forever chemicals. I was just listening to the show. It's a fabulous source for your listeners to go listen to. And 1A is available from NPR as a podcast. It's today's edition about PFAS. Okay. Um, and if you picking up on PFAS, the signature compound or one of the signature compounds is perfluorooctanoic acid or PFOA. And I, I recommend to your audience, if they haven't already done so, that they watch the movie Dark Waters, which is about DuPont yep. destroying it, trashing a town in Parksburg, West Virginia, where it's made. It's a horrible story. Um, and it's it. But, in, but it's a great movie. It's a great movie. It's a oh, it's a fantastic movie. And I will tell you, Robert Ballot, the the hero of that movie, who is a lawyer, who is played by Mark Ruffalo. Okay. Yep. I was going to so, say, I know I've heard of this movie, so I will have to watch yeah, it. Well, he's as big a hero as Hercules. He's as big a hero as the best of the ancient heroes, because you see him suffering almost to death to do the right thing for the people of west of parksburg west virginia it's mm -hmm. a truly uh, and it's also ast astounding and important to note that he's an american this was done and achieved in america it wouldn't be done or achieved in china it wouldn't be done or achieved in russia it might be done in europe the Europe's tend to have their act together <laughs> a lot better. So it needs to be, needs, yep. you, you need a little bit less of, of this sort of activity, but it is, uh, it is a test of me to the strength of American democracy that this actually happened, as well as being a horrible story about what goes on in American democracy. Okay. So you actually led into my next question. I would, I'm curious how the U S compares to other first world countries when it comes to endocrine disruptors and these kinds of chemicals that are in our environment. Are there other countries that do much better? Are there other countries where you don't see this kind of endocrine disruption? Endocrine disruption is present worldwide. There's no country where you can escape from it, but there are some places like the European union that are making very serious efforts to get ahead of the problem and do it right. And they're, do, they're doing it in two different ways, which we've already mentioned. They're, uh, one is they're establishing regulations that are vastly uh, safer than the regulations we have in place. Just to give you one example, the European Food Safety Authority, which is sort of like the European FDA, mm -hmm. um, it recently in December of this past year, it recommended that the allowable daily intake of bisphenol A be reduced by a factor of 100,000 compared to what it is now. And that's over a million compared to what the US is now. Okay. That's wow. how bad the FDA is. But the European Union is taking endocrine science, the science developed by endocrinologists who are physicians and scientists who study how hormones work. Uh, they're taking that science very seriously. And they're, they, they've put together something called the, the European Chemical Strategy for Sustainability. Okay. And it's deeply informed by endocrine science. It reflects all the stuff we're talking about here. But the other thing that the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, in, in addition to having standards that are vastly safer, it's putting serious money into generating new chemicals that are designed to be safer. Mm -hmm. That's sustainable chemistry. Uh, and the combination of those two is going to leave the U.S. chemical industry in the dust because people want safer materials in what they buy for their kids and for, and for their food. Okay, so Harry, you... I know. go ahead. Yeah, I'm that gonna... leads into a curious uh, burden in my life for about the last six or eight months. I've been trying to write this essay for as as a sort of for the European Union to consider about what the new field called that they're calling safe and sustainable chemistry should look like. And you would think it would be easy because we started, I was part of a group of people who started a field called green chemistry back in uh, the early 90s. And unfortunately, what happened to green chemistry is industry 
took it over. It basically became about cleaning up reaction processes in chemical plants so that you use less toxic stuff and you produce less toxic stuff and you save money. Um, of course, that's a good thing to do. But the one thing that we, I, I of course, uh, 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 were identified endocrine disruption as the premier problem. I mean, very often people are cleaning up reactions to make endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes absolutely no sense. It was impossible in the world of green chemistry to tackle endocrine disruption because it's so hostile to industry. You really have to get rid of these compounds. I mean, we have one of the biggest makers, Cabestro, right here in Pittsburgh. And so you really have to get rid of these compounds. And the question is, well, how are we going to do that? Yeah. And when you look at how they're integrated into the technology and the economy, um, it's just shocking the amount of change that we're going to have to do to reduce the exposures that are essential for a good future. So what role can the cleaning and restoration industry kind of play in this as we're trying to remove these bad toxins and chemicals from our environment and not be putting more of them into homes and schools as we're going in after maybe a water loss or a fire or we're going in to clean or disinfect or whatever that may be. How can our industry specifically be helping with reducing this footprint? Do you want to start, Peter? Do you want me to? Go ahead, Terry. So the what ha what happens, you, you see it time and time again, a chemical technology gets entrenched. It then gets identified as bad. And then the, the cleanup industry comes in and pulls the stuff out, all dressed up in hazard suits and what. So lead piping is a great example. Mm -hmm. Asbestos is a great example. Lead paint is a great example. Um, unfortunately, we're going to be looking at, at the polycarbonate plastics and the other things in that way in the future, because what we do with them right now is we toss them to landfills. And when they get into landfills, they actually break down slowly and re-release the BPA and you get water coming off landfills that's just incredibly contaminated with BPA. This, this is an estrogen. It behaves like the female hormone. And so you, we reviewed the literature of this. You cannot find a pocket of the ecosphere anywhere that's not contaminated by BPA. You find, and it's a man-made substance. It doesn't turn up in nature. You find it in translucent shrimp at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. It's one of the compounds that can, I'm segueing a little bit, but I'll come back to your, your question. No it's problem. one of the compounds that's responsible, in my opinion, after a very great deal of reading, for the dramatic drop in human fertility. So Western males are losing sperm count at, a, at, a, at about one to one and a half percent per year, every single year. Wow. If you project the data from, we have uh, excellent data um, that, uh, from, from 1970, 1971 to 2011, 1973 to 2011. If you project that data, this is the work of Dr. Shana Swan and colleagues, if you project that data, you have sperm count asymptotically approaching zero in 2045. That's the young boys that are being born today will be of reproductive age in 2045. And so the question for your audience is, do they know young couples who want to have children who are having trouble having children? And this is something that didn't often happen when I was yeah. young. Yep. And it's happening now all the time. And oh. it's going to get worse and eventually it's going to be of tidal wave. It is becoming of tidal wave proportions. That's what, the, I, why wouldn't these chemicals be doing it? They do it, they do it to every animal species virtually that we know of mm -hmm. if you test them with concentrations that we find in our urine. So how do we handle this? It requires an immense shakeup of thinking and what we actually do at every level. The remediation industry has definitely uh, got a role to play. Yep. Number one thing is stop putting these compounds into the economy. That's where we have to start. And this, I, this, I just said something that's such a volatile, I, I recognize the immense volatility and and uh, screechiness <laughs> from people who, who, because millions and millions of people are making their their livelihoods by selling and using these compounds. Yeah. So, so specifically, uh, specifically to your question, um, 
there are products in the market today that are safer than many of those that are widely used. Okay. Uh, and I would encourage your listeners <laughs> and your readers, your audience, to visit some of the websites that have developed lists of chemicals and cleaners that are safer, mm -hmm. at least by the standards of current testing. Okay. Um, so I, just as one example, there's a company, a nonprofit called Made Safe, madesafe.org, that has developed a very long list of alternatives to traditional cleaning products. Go there, see what they say. Now, we're, we're in a bit of a quandary because nothing has been tested perfectly, okay? There's always unknowns, but, but we know enough now to know that some things are safer than others. And I think Made Safe is one of the organizations that can help you find alternatives to uh, materials you're currently using. Okay, okay. All right, I think this might be a good time to insert um, talking about the TAML. I'm curious if you pronounce, if you actually say TAML or if you say TAML catalysts, what exactly that means. Can you explain what those catalysts are, what that means? Okay. We say TAML. We say TAML. Ta yeah. Tamil, yeah, Tamil, yeah. I'll give and you a look. Terry at is the inventor of Tamil catalysts okay. over 40 years. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of history. So when I started my academic career in 1980, I uh, the thinking was, wouldn't it be great if you could disinfect water with hydrogen peroxide rather than chlorine? Mm -hmm. Because then you wouldn't have the chlorinated disinfection byproducts that we know are responsible for some cancers that would require a catalyst. The reactions will occur, but they're not fast enough with hydrogen peroxide. So I set about trying to design catalysts that would activate hydrogen peroxide to disinfect water. And I came up with an iterative design loop and we followed it for 15 years, um, got, cycling it about 20 times. And at the end of that, we had came in one morning and there was the data. We had the catalyst that we were after. We subsequently proved that they were outperforming the enzymes. I'd hope to get even close to the enzymes, but they clearly... Terry, Terry, you didn't mention that you were biomimicking peroxidase enzymes. You yeah, mentioned so the hydrogen right. peroxide, but that's a, a key part of the story is the biomimicry. Yeah, yeah. so, so that, that yeah, thank you. So, you know, if you're a chemist and you want to make stuff that helps nature rather than hurts nature, then, then you what you're going to do is... The first thing you're going to do is you're going to try to use the same elements nature uses to make us. We're not made of the entire periodic table. We're made of a very yeah. small fraction of it for, uh, and with a lot, with, with a large amount of the elements and then a sprinkling of some other elements. But much of the periodic tab table doesn't feature in life. Mm -hmm. Nature gets the selectivity that gets the reactions go from going to A to B as it wants rather than A to B to C plus C plus D plus E plus F plus G, a mess, it gets it with absolutely super amazing reactivity design, mostly carried out by catalysts. And so what we decided is we're going to use the same elements nature uses. That was rule one. And then rule two is we activate hydrogen peroxide. Nature doesn't use chlorine that, uh, to disinfect water. It uses hydrogen peroxide. To, to disinfect and then finally um we uh, pete i think you're going to want to say something i was just going to say that hydrogen peroxide uh in nature is in us uh the enzymes that terry biomimicked are in us they are largely in our livers but they're in a lot of different cells and they uh they detoxify uh, a wide range of toxic chemicals, and they also kill microbes. So they, they do two things. And that's so what in, Terry set out to mimic. Okay. So, so the design loop that I talked about is still ongoing. We are improving. These catalysts, which are all, have, have since they were born in 1995, the Tamil system, have been the best uh, catalyst in this class of chemistry um, of all time. And then Pete comes along in the late 90s with endocrine disruptors, and after talking with them, it became about two things. It, it became about also getting, because we can burn our endocrine disruptors out of wastewater with the catalysts. And we can, we can 
uh, but but we wanted to know that we didn't weren't making things worse. How did we know if we the catalysts weren't endocrine disruptors or their products weren't? And that's where Pete came in and and in 2008 and put together an incredible team of people to figure out to answer the question well how do you know if you've got an endocrine disruptor and we all worked for 25 of us for five years um lots of calls uh, very frequently number of retreats and wrote a paper that we published in green tech chemistry in 2013 designing endocrine disruption out of the next generation of chemicals. And really- I, I should mention oh, yeah. that some of the, those retreats were actually fun because <laughs> we had two, two different two different types of people, chemists and biologists. And normally there isn't a lot of discussion between them, although the more there is, the better it gets. Okay, sure. So w- we had some really talented people helping us figure out how do we break down the barriers between the chemists and the biologists. And I'll never forget one episode, which was at a... Rockefeller Foundation Retreat Center uh, near Sleepy Hollow. Okay. Just before Halloween. <laughs> no. And these these brilliant people got oh, no. a dozen pumpkins that they brought into the scientists and put them in front. And the, the task of the scientists, first of all, they they couldn't hold a glass of wine and have a knife in their hands at the same time. Okay, that was wah, wah. Good, good idea. <laughs> but what 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 they did was they said, okay. I want you to illustrate with your carving of a pumpkin this the effects of endocrine disruption. Oh. One of the pumpkins can be shown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, what it did, is it just broke, oh, broke all down like the barrier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, was there any yeah. pumpkin left to show? Like <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't oh put it in ways that 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 wouldn't be put in shown in polite circles. Put it that way, because because of course, endocrine disruptors hit the reproductive tract, and that's where you really, really see, uh, particularly the male reproductive tract. Not that they're not hitting the female reproductive tract. Also, we know they clearly are, yeah. but it's just so much easier to measure, uh, for obvious reasons, the the male effects. And also so much easier to represent them with a carved pumpkin. A very much easier, yes. <laughs> I love it. See, scientists can have fun too. It's fine. <laughs> I I have so many ways that I want to take this this conversation, but I guess let's talk about how the Tamil catalysts played into the creation of Dot Cleaner and where that came from, the foundation of Dot. So so once you've got the cat, so here's one of the problems with American. Uh, academic culture right now you cannot talk about things that are hostile to the corporations and expect to be funded Mm -hmm. by the government because the influence of the the, the, your colleagues will run in shock if you do anything controversial and you will not get funded so one of the things i had to do because i could see this coming uh uh the minute i read um our stolen future in fact in fact i wrote a paper in science saying this was coming that this was just going to be the most extra if you did it properly it was going to be extremely difficult to fund the research so consequently i was off thinking well how am i going to do it and one of the ways was if the cattle so good if i could get a company the income from that could fund it and then you'd be able to talk about what has to be talked about without having your academic throat cut um and so i struggled through three companies to get it together the people part of it is just as critical as the technology part of it and I never got it right until one morning I thought who do I really want because we're doing a new company who do I really want to spend the rest of my my life with in this company and suddenly Pete popped popped right into my my head and I called Pete up and said hey Pete I want you to be part of this new company because we had new new pattern patterns filed on on the latest generation of catalysts this is a few years ago Um, and they were they were clearly inventive, and we now have patents in Europe and North America and the applications out, elsewhere. And so I thought, well, we need, uh, I want to be with Pete. And so I called him up, and he took it from there, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's actually the, what happened. He called me out of the blue. I mean, we talk, as he said, almost every day anyway. Uh, but um, he called me, said, I'd like you to be part of the company. And I thought for uh, at least a nanosecond, uh, and I said yes. Um, because um, I, I had witnessed Terry struggling in trying to stand his company up in the past. 
and I realized I had I have uh, an unusually broad network of different types of contacts, and that's what Terry needed. He needed someone he trusts me, and someone with a network me, and so literally I I within a, a week um, I had convinced a neighbor who happens to be a billionaire to invest in the company. Um, and now this, I've known this guy for a long time. He's a wonderful man. Uh, he, when he, he, he read our stolen future when it came out and uh, when he eats cheese that's been wrapped in plastic, he scrapes the surface off. He takes this endocrine disruption very seriously. And so he, he committed to, um, to funding the startup. And he then helped us through his networks to find our CEO, Roger Berry, who is fabulous. Um, and R Roger assembled a team. And this, the, Terry's call came on February 10th, 2020, just before COVID hit. Yeah. I'll never forget. Yeah. But by, by June, it, it, it had gone so well. We had, our CEO started June 1st. He, he then assembled what has become a fantastic team. There are about 25 people. We've got production facilities in Puerto Rico and, and Pittsburgh. Uh, we've got a, a product, which is what I know you want to get to in the market today, which cleans up mold infestations uh, faster, more cheaply, more effectively than any of the product. And it uses a, a lot less chemicals uh, to do it, get its job done. Uh, Terry, what would you like to say now? That, that that's just great <laughs> that's a perfect summary um so so oh i i remember i there's one other thing uh, i'm sorry terry uh terry and i as you can tell are really committed to getting the chemistry right mm -hmm. and the biology right and so we've done um two things that are uh somewhat different we created a team of endocrine disruption specialists world leaders uh to test our chemicals to make sure they're not endocrine disrupting. And second, both Terry and I um, gave, you know, my, uh, I, I gave all of my shares to a trust, so I can't benefit economically. And Terry gave most of his shares to a trust. And what we're going to do with that trust, those two trusts, is we will use them as charitable funders to push, to invest in research in sustainable chemistry and environmental health, especially endocrine disruption. And it will, if we're successful, and there's reason to believe um, that the Tamil catalysts will massively disrupt several, if not a dozen multi-billion dollar industries as it's as we develop the different types of things it can do, um, that source of funding will become a major player in avoiding the problem ter Terry identified earlier, which is if you want to do serious challenging stuff how do you do it uh and with how do you fund it without having to go to government or industry yes okay all right so for those who are listening i do have a podcast that i did with brian lester and roger berry um who you just mentioned so people who haven't heard about dot cleaner you can go and listen to that podcast but i do want to dive a little bit more into um pete you did just answer it a little bit but what makes dot different from other mold removal products that are out there uh it, it worked well terry you can handle it. you're you're the inventor Go ahead, Pete. You 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 got going. Well, what makes it different? It's got a a, a biomimic mimicking catalyst in it that is unique. There's no there's nothing like it anywhere else, and it it potentiates the activity of oxidizing agents with which it comes into contact. It works with hypochlorite, but hypochlorite's chlorine based, and so while right now we use a tiny amount of hypochlorite in dot cleaner we're working towards the next generation, which will only use hydrogen peroxide. So that that is a huge difference. Um, and from Brian Lester, whom you mentioned, yep. we learned who, who has, Brian is a fabulous guy, he, he, a great representative for Sudoc and Dot Cleaner. Um, he has a lot of experience in using Tamil Catalyst as a cleaner and quickly, quickly found that uh, it was so much better than any alternative product that was on the market because it didn't wind up uh, having to 
he, he avoided all sorts of the byproducts of, of using chlorine based chemistry. So what, I feel like this is kind of an obvious question, but what helped you arrive on deciding to have the delivery of the product different? Dot doesn't come in big plastic jugs or big drums or whatever. The delivery of it is different. So what helped you arrive on deciding that we're going to have this be completely different than other options on the market? Well, that was Brian's experience. Um, okay. and, and Brian was a, a lead person in helping us figure out how to make this product better. Actually, not coming in big jugs means there's far fewer energy costs associated with the transport of that. There's water where you're going in the house. The house that you're about to clean up has water supplied to it. Use that water. Don't truck the water 20 miles in the back of your pickup. Yeah. Um, the, the delivery uh, unit is a little package, um, which weighs just a couple, depending upon how much dot is in it it only weighs a few ounces at most mm -hmm. and so so we we of course in my research group Carnegie Mellon focus on how the catalyst works and what it does and so we we look at is a catalytic cycle so the catalyst interacts with the hypochlorite or the peroxide or some other oxidant it makes an active form the active form bleaches the mold stain or does something else and returns to the parent catalyst and around the circle it keeps going. So it turns out the circle's really complicated and we have got insight into it that I would I think it's the, the deepest insight into an oxidation catalytic cycle ever because it has so many of these intersecting circles and things things going on. So we 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 study that in great detail. Um, and what it means, what, what it translates to is if you were, for example, using hypochlorite to get rid of your mold stain, the molecules bump up against the mold stain molecules like this all the time, uh, but most of, mostly nothing happens. When the catalyst bumps into the, the, um, the hypochlorite, very quickly it makes the, the um, actasis and virtually, not every time, but a much higher frequency when the catalyst hits the mold saying the reaction happens. So you, what's it's called is you lower the barrier, the energy barrier for the reaction to proceed. And it, this happens in so many technologies you can't believe. Uh, the mold, this amazing disappearance of mm -hmm. mold stain with almost mm -hmm. no, no hypochlorite there, so you can hardly smell it. Uh, and a teeny tiny amount of the catalyst um is quite amazing to watch but when you project that into water we can burn because really you are oxidation is burning it's just the reactions aren't all happening at once and releasing a giant amount of energy they're re releasing that they're, they're happening uh, in in water so it's fire and water we can burn endocrine disruptors out of municipal wastewater a lot of them all the most concerning ones and a lot of the other ones and um, what I really hope we'll do is take immense endocrine disruption pressure off nature by taking this very simple technology of the catalyst plus hydrogen peroxide to treat municipal wastewater just before it goes into a river or lake, removing these extremely... They're, they're, one of the things that's happening is we're wrecking aquatic life in the rivers and lakes of Europe and North America and everywhere else. So it's, it's... have a dramatic impact there. So to give you an idea as to how powerful the catalyst is, one kilo, two, two, two plus pounds of catalyst can clean up 22,500 tons of water. So that's the daily output of 150,000 Europeans. And the Europeans are really worried about this and they're, the technology they're uh, looking mostly at to develop is ozone. And so that the performance that Pete just talked about is equivalent to three parts a million ozone. And wow. ours is a much more simple technology. And we think cheaper. it will ultimately be much And cheaper. also we believe a lot cheaper. cheaper ultimately. And once you scale up the production, we can see the catalyst costs coming down where, where and, and because we get all the nasty estrogens and some of the worst compounds out very quickly, most of the intricate disruption pressures taken off the water 
easily. Some other compounds are there, and, and there are some we can't get, like EFOA, for example, indestructible damn stuff. Um, and this, of course, reflects back to what's going on. The, the chemical industry making organofluorines isn't going to stop. There's no way. And they're making more all the time, and you run into one problem after the next, after the next, because nature can't deal with these compounds. It can't break them down. Yes. Yes. Okay. So talking about endocrine, endocrine disruptors, Pete, talk about your book, Our Stolen Future. It's come up a few times in our conversation, but you wrote that in the mid nineties. So you have seen all of these problems coming. What did you see coming in the nineties? What prompted you or inspired you to read that book and do that research then? Well, I, I should uh, mention that um, I wrote it with two other people, uh, okay. Theo Colborn and Diane Dumanoski. Uh, and Theo and I had been working together for several years as this field was opening up. Um, and we realized that there was enough science that we needed to write a book for public consumption. We needed to draw public attention to it, in part because funding was very difficult to get for that science. And so we wanted to raise public concerns. We wanted to increase the amount of funding going into the scientific lab, studying it. And we also wanted to draw public attention and begin pressuring the agencies to regulate endocrine disruption um, for the problems that it causes. That was 25 years ago, uh, a little bit more. As I've often put it, when we back in those days, we were in the medical slash scientific wilderness. Mm -hmm. We're now mainstream. We are mainstream. Um, yep. The Endocrine Society, which is the professional association of physicians and scientists who treat patients with endocrine-related re problems, um, prostate cancer, um, breast cancer, diabetes, et cetera, they take this very seriously. The Endocrine Society, this is the biggest public policy issue that endoc the Endocrine Society is tackling on a global basis. It's deeply involved uh, in the development of the chemical strategy for sustainability in Europe that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So we've gone from a bunch of nuts in a, our own little huts in the wilderness uh, to now leading a, a global effort to address endocrine disruption at the scale it must be addressed. And it's mm -hmm. while some of my colleagues are frustrated by how slow we're moving now, I look back on the record mm -hmm. And we've come so far um, we, and we got a long ways to go. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Long ways to go. So where do we go next? What, what are your goals over the next five, 10 years? What do you hope to see happen specifically in the U S when it comes to endocrine disruptors and how we can kind of reverse the damage that we've done on our society and our environment? I think the most important thing that Terry and I can do is ensure that SUDOC becomes successful. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a big company selling safer chemicals and selling chemicals that clean things up that currently can't be cleaned up. I, I think that's an incredibly important contribution that we can make. Uh, and, and, and doing it without, without bringing the same problems, you know, you know removing problems without get, jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. Mm-hmm. Too, too often, today's solutions become tomorrow's problems. Yeah. And we're committed to that not happening. Yes. Um, there are policy interventions in the U.S. that are absolutely essential. And there we're beginning to see some steps in the right direction. Right now, there's pressure on the FDA coming from the, the what I mentioned earlier, that the European version of the FDA has just decided that they have to lower their tolerable daily intake of one chemical, bisphenol A, by a factor of 100,000. They openly acknowledge that there are going to be many other chemicals that they are going to look at again that are also going to require similar reductions in, in exposure and thus similar reductions in use. Um, it's going to change the chemical industry because at the same time, as I said, uh, Europe is investing in sustainable chemistry so that safe alternatives, safer alternatives can be substituted for stuff that we know is bad. Um, and then the, the movement in Europe on that is perhaps, if I squint, uh, beginning to have 
uh, a noticeable effect uh, in the U.S., um, specifically because a number of very uh, well-informed nonprofit organizations and scientists are are petitioning the FDA, saying, "Wait a second, what does Europe know that we that you don't? And how do we how do we get to you the information that Europe has so that you too can?" make the types of scientific changes that you need to make. Now, FDA has fought that uh, ever since I've been involved in this issue. Um, uh, There are many reasons for that problem. There are good people at the FDA, but there are also people who um, basically want to get good jobs in industry. So it's called a revolving door and they get good jobs if they if they don't harm industry. We have to eliminate that type of practice if, for the FDA to truly perform its, its duties. And, and Michelle, picking up on, on what Pete's saying, um, you know, we it's actually potentially a very good time. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, Senator Manchin just got religion recently, thank God. And we're seeing, so, so we're going to see major investment in handling the energy issues. Mm-hmm. This is critical. And there, it, it, people mostly think there's one big issue that's threatening the sustainability of our civilization, and that's energy and particularly climate change. But actually, there are three. One is indeed climate, climate change. The second is nuclear mishap or misadventure. In terms of misadventure, you've heard just recently the, um, the leader of the United Nations saying, we get, we're, we're very close to blowing ourselves to bits. Let's stop this nonsense. Uh, but we also have problems of nuclear reactors in terms of um, uh, unlucky stuff happening. But the third is endocrine disruption. Endocrine disruption, I told you about the sperm counts. It's an equally serious pressure. And if I, I believe the energy movement towards energy is going to pull the other things along and that we'll start getting much better, more rational leadership and hopefully um, start making these changes much more seriously. New jobs through energy will allow us to reshape the chemical enterprise as well. So Terry has cited the data on sperm count decline, which is a, a, a very large problem. Yeah. We see a solution, which is getting endocrine disruption chemicals out of drinking water, out of sewage water, out of in reducing exposures. But the other, another very important piece of these, these problems is miswired brains. We, we know that endocrine disrupting chemicals change how your brains grow. And they contribute to behavioral problems, uh, ADHD almost certain, well, evidence on ADHD is strong, but also there's evidence suggesting that autism uh, and autism is increasing. Yeah. Um, it may be increasing because of exposures to endocrine disrupting compounds. A projection similar to what Terry talked about with respect to um, sperm count, that it will approach zero by 2045. It turns, some other scientists have done a calculation how fast is autism growing? Well, they're projecting that one in two boys by 2055 could be autistic. How do you have a functional society if that's the case? You don't. No. I, and, and, and so it's looking like the relationship between male reproductive tract uh, anomalies and autism and intellectual deficits are, that looks, looks like they're correlated. Hmm. I'm the mom of two little boys over here. So listening to you guys say a lot of this is like, oh my goodness, I have an eight-year-old and a three-year-old. So, all right. So talk a little bit about what tiered protocol for endocrine disruption is. What does that mean? Uh, That's the protocol. It's Think of it as as an intellectual framework. This is what Terry and I developed with the help of 30-odd colleagues and led to those uh, distorted pumpkins. Um, (laughs) So... uh, think of it as an intellectual framework that can help that can give chemists the tools the the design tools to avoid endocrine disruption as they are synthesizing new materials that's the bottom line of what it is it tells them well here's the here is how you can structure a series of tests in a molecule you've just invented that would 
the to the best of, of today's science would be, would be able to tell is this likely to be an endocrine disrupting compound and so we know how to do that the science that i have been working on for 30 years is actually it's it's advanced a lot in 30 years we know how to make those choices and now the question is how do we get chemists to use the system and it's what we're doing we hope that type that sudoc and the steps it's taking to ensure that the solutions we offer today don't become tomorrow's problems we hope we can inspire other companies to do and, the same thing and starting right in 2008 where we began this exercise we published the paper in 2013 we began using the tamil system to beta test the tests <laughs> so so we we formed collaborations <laughs> with the people who who um who uh you know were uh the world leaders of endocrine disruption putting this together um and so when we came to form the company we had pretty good confidence that we were going to escape endocrine disruption and since then as pete's mentioned we've done we're, we're in the process of doing very elaborate sophisticated assays for endocrine disruption in mice frogs and zebrafish and and these are tests that no regulatory agency requires we're, we're going way far beyond what the agencies require. Okay. All right. So as you on the science side work toward writing our society here, what are things that consumers or restoration or cleaning company owners or myself can do to avoid endocrine disruptors and chemicals in our day-to-day -day lives now? I'll, I'll just pop this in and then Pete will give, give an expanded answer. The number one thing to do, I believe, is to is is to uh, feed your family on organic food. Mm -hmm. It does cost more, but the Environmental Working Group showed that you can, if you move, if you think in the Whole Foods. I know a lot of people don't shop at Whole Foods because it's more expensive, but if you move from the conventional, i.e., with chemicals, to organic without chemicals, you can watch the the um, uh, pesticides, many of which are endocrine disruptors washing out of your urine filter your water is another thing using these carbon uh, filter systems they claim to re re remove the chemicals and it's probably reliable okay. lots of lots of choices you, you can make yourself uh, uh, to reduce your exposures one common exposure if not the most common which a lot of people don't know is that thermal paper the types of Paper, the type of paper that's used to make receipts from wow. a gasoline pump or from your uh, uh, getting cash at the, yeah. the uh, bank. Um, there's no printer. There's no, excuse me, there's no ink in that printer as the paper comes out. Instead, there are um, micro capsules of a dye embedded in the paper that when the paper comes out, They've got these hot needles that form the pattern of the letter that they want. And they break the little bubble the, the, in which the dye, the dye rises to the surface of the paper where it combines with bisphenol A, which is coating the surface. Every time you handle one of those things, you're, tr it, you're likely transferring BPA to your fingers and then it's being absorbed into your body. It's a major source of exposure. And, and um, it's not BPA, it's a substitute BPA, and sometimes uh, they can be worse than BPA itself in terms of their estrogenic properties. So hit no when receipt, we, no, I don't want a receipt. <laughs> no, you don't. And, and unfortunately, also air, airplane tickets and uh, baggage tags from mm -hmm. airplanes also use that printing technology. Um, there are there are some replacements that, that uh, have been substituted for BPA, but like Terry said, um, often they're just as bad, if not worse, than BPA. So, take a photo. I take photographs of receipts, uh, and my company accepts them. Yeah, you can you can do it. Yeah, you, yes. you can certainly reduce the exposures. Uh, it turns out that most money uh, bills, a uh, dollar bill, uh, in most currencies, because people have taken those receipts and stuck them in their wallets or their pocketbooks. They transfer the BPA to the to the money, so that's another source of exposure. Ma um, makeup, makeup is a big source of exposure. Talking about stuff you plaster on yourselves. 
and and a lot of the products that we use to clean ourselves at uh, shampoos and things like that underarms you have to be it it's it's a nightmare to to ask the question how do i keep endocrine disruptors off my body uh, when you look at what's in the list of ingredients in- uh, here's a really simple recommendation don't microwave in plastic don't the, the companies will claim that it's uh microwave safe don't <laughs> trust it no. um and it's just it's so easy not to microwave in plastic yeah um the other thing was a more gen- a general recommendation is processed food is processed it goes through all sorts of industrial processes which turn out often are the sort are the ways that chemicals you don't want get into the food supply mm-hmm. so minimize your consumption of processed food that's very very important also yes yeah if you're using a big press to make your to make your food such as crushing um seeds for canola oil or something like that it's very it turns out that um a perfluorinated oils are used in the machinery um and of course the chance for transfer has to be there there's a really interesting uh body of work being done by a mommy blogger named Leia Segedy who has a blog called Momovation as in mommy motivation Momovation okay um she has been testing consumer products of all types for the the forever chemicals and finding them in a, <laughs> a wide array but she's also finding that some don't and so what she publishes are lists of uh here are products that you may want to buy um of them these don't have perfluorinated contamination and these do okay i'm gonna very 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 practical advice okay i love it all right well gentlemen thank you so much for a wonderful conversation is there anything else that you want to add before we wrap it up well thanks for having us i mean it's been a real 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 pleasure michelle thank you thank you so much for having us i i second that it's been my pleasure. For as well. more restoration today, visit our website, cnrmagazine.com, or find us wherever you get your favorite podcast.